Hi, my name is Carol Wyatt Evans. I'm the Chemicals and the Environment Agent here at UFI Fist Extension in Sarasota County. I want to say thank you for joining us today, um, our presentation on Bioirrational Pesticides Alternative Products for Pest Control. So an overview of today's presentation. First, we're going to go over a quick history of pesticides. Then we'll talk about biopesticides and a little bit about the most common products for our landscape and what they're most effective at controlling. And then sprinkled throughout the presentation is the main principles of integrated pest management or IPM. Okay, our speed round. So when we use the term pesticide, we're talking about substances that are used to control, to prevent, to destroy, repel, or even attract an organism that we deem a pest. So pesticides ultimately are used to control and or kill the pest. So pesticide is actually the umbrella word that encompasses all the different products that are used against specific organisms. For instance, insecticides are used to control or kill insects. Herbicides are used to control grasses, weeds, and plants. Rodenticides are used uh, to control rodents, so you get the picture. Now, pesticides have been around for a very long time. Um, they were used approximately 4,500 years ago um, when the Sumerians used sulfur compounds to control insects and mites on crops. And then through the centuries, many inorganics have been used along with botanicals or, or plant extracts. But integrated pest management was also used extensively in conjunction with those products. So IPM, is a program that incorporates multiple strategies such as cultural, mechanical, and biological controls in order to manage insect pests. But it's something that takes time and effort, both in the ancient times as well as at today. So um, by the 19th century, there were extensive use of botanical products um, and pyrethrums were established as a very good insecticide. But in the middle of the 20th century, we had the discovery of DDT. And DDT was the pesticide that changed the way we use pesticides. And it was the official start of the synthetic pesticide era. So dichloral, diphenyl, trichloroethane, DDT. It was the active ingredient that became the magic bullet for a very short period of time before it was realized how incredibly destructive and detrimental it was for the environment, for people, and for wildlife. Now, overuse of DDT led to quick and extensive insect resistance in many um, insect species. So it was obvious that we really needed to evaluate our, our pesticide practices and we needed to make some adjustments and make them fast. So DDT was the product that started the synthetic pesticide era, uh, but the number of products that came on the market and their use increased quickly in the 1950s and the 1960s. And the reason for that was that they were really cheap. Um, they worked quickly. They were you know, really effective and had this broad spectrum activity, um, which means basically that it controls a lot of insects with that one product. They had a real stable, long shelf life and were easy to use. And overall, they were actually quite safe to the applicator. Um, their use allowed more successful crops with larger yields. This helped to bring down food costs and labor costs but their overuse made, um, made us complacent and we got away from using IPM. So overall, um, synthetics were a huge success for the most part until insecticide resistance became an even more problematic. However, the consequences we've been confronted with for the overuse of synthetic pesticides has created a pathway um, to products we now have in our pesticide toolbox, which are overall safer to us into the environment, to wildlife, and these are these bioirrational uh, products or bioirrational pesticides. So um, just in a side note, um, there were more than a thousand pesticides used around the world on food crops with the U.S. having over 500 active uh, ingredient pesticides for use in ag alone. Now we apply over 1 billion pounds of pesticides in the U.S. each year. Yes, that is billion with a B. Uh, that's an alarming amount, especially when you consider its, you know, its relation um, in 1945, when there were only, only 100 million pounds applied. So I am very happy that you're, you're here today and to learn about these alternative products to conventional chemicals. Now, bioirrational pesticides are an alternative option to conventional chemicals. 
they're overall safer for people, safer for wildlife, safer to our environment, and are considered minimal impact pesticides. When we discuss most of these today, um, they can be called many different names. So, you know, I interchange it too. So birational pesticides, alternative pesticides, botanical pesticides, minimal risk pesticides. However, you may hear of a group of pesticides which are called reduced risk pesticides. Now, reduced risk pesticides are actually a class or group of conventional chemicals. They are not birational pesticides, but if you have to use a conventional chemical, then these reduced risk pesticides are the, they're newer chemistries and they're really the best options to use when you need to apply a conventional chemical. They're typically softer on beneficial insects, um, which means they're better against beneficial insects and natural enemies. Um, they have reduced environmental impacts and they are much better alternatives to use uh, as compared to older chemistries like our organophosphates, our carbamates and organochlorines. So those older chemistries are particularly harsh products um, to use from an environmental perspective. Now, I can't talk about pesticides without talking about integrated pest management or IPM and the connection between the two. Now, the use of any pesticide, whether it's a conventional chemical or a biorational product, is part of an integrated pest management strategy. The name might sound a bit intimidating, but it's fairly straightforward. If you've ever used a fly swatter or smacked a mosquito on your arm or stepped on a cockroach, then you've actually practiced IPM. You did the job using the least invasive method with minimal to no impact on the environment. Now, IPM is an approach that incorporates cultural, mechanical, and biological strategies to control nuisance pests, whether that's an insect or a plant. Now, those strategies are used first, but if they don't control the problem, then we turn into birational pesticides that are the least toxic to use. Now, if the biological products don't control the pest, um, of course, when we use them correctly, then we can turn to a conventional chemical as a last, result, last resort. But when you're deciding to use any chemical product, you want to use target, targeted insect-specific uh, pesticides and try at all costs to stay away from those broad spectrum uh, systemic pesticides. Those should be used for very limited and difficult pest insect issues in the back your, in, your, in your landscape, such as like saving a prized um, you know, rose bush or, or plant. Um, so the products that we're discussing today are the alternative products, so the biorationals that are these minimal risk and least toxic. But please do not be fooled into thinking that they are the magic bullet. Some of them take a bit of time to understand how to use, but once you realize their capabilities, you're gonna be pleasantly surprised at how um, effective they are and how you can actually feel more confident at controlling unwanted pests without impacting the environment. Now, biopesticides are generally less toxic and that's to non-target organisms and to the environment. They are very, a very powerful tool to have in your landscape maintenance toolbox um, at controlling pest insects. And as I already mentioned, um, they are best and most successful when you use them as part of an IPM program. But before turning to any, any sort of chemical product or any sort of control, you first need to do a proper insect identification. So know what insect you are looking at and making sure it's something that actually needs to be controlled and you know it's not a beneficial insect or a natural enemy. So there are lots of reference sources as well as webinars that talk about uh, beneficials and pest insects. I happen to offer a few of them, um, but just make sure that you find the resources that cover the insects in your area or your region. So the challenge with identify insects is that there's not a lot, you know, that there are a lot of different insects, so you're not gonna find them all in one resource. Um, you know, they're gonna, you're gonna wanna find resources that are specific to your region um, and at least ones that tell you the insect families. And if they do also can tell you the, the genus and the species. However, if you can get a reference book that gives you a general idea of even just the order of the insect that it's in and allow you to tell the difference between a, you know, a, a pest insect and a 
true bug or a beneficial insect, um, you know, even the difference between something like a termite and an ant. So after proper insect identification, you know, other practices that you should apply before turning to any sort of chemical application um, are things that include cultural practices. So planting a healthy, disease-free plant in the right place. Um, I tend to be the one that buys those clearance plants, uh, which, you know, breaks the second rule of the Florida Friendly uh, Nine Rules. And then I struggle with them to get them to grow properly. So um, sometimes that's just a losing battle. But um, your next thing is like mechanical practices. That's things like trimming and pruning and mulching the area. Then biological controls. So using natural enemies to your advantage. So these are the insects such as lady beetles and lacewings and wasp parasitoids. They are all natural enemies um, of pest insects and you're gonna wanna take care of them and try to actually recruit them and conserve them in your yard. So when you still have a pest problem, then you consider using a bio-rational product that is pest specific, and then only turn to conventional chemicals out of, as a very last resort to um, deal with that insect issue if you haven't already resolved it with, you know, by implementing those other you know, previous steps that I just mentioned. Now, what makes um, biopesticides so good? Well, first thing is they have fast breakdown. And most actually uh, degrade rapidly in either sunlight, in the air, or in moisture, which means that the result is there is little to no uh, residual or residue, and products do not persist long in the environment. So this reduces the risk to non-target organisms, especially important for protecting our beneficial insects and our honeybees, as well as the natural enemies to pest insects. However, a few things to keep in mind are things like precise timing is really important. So I re remember I said that they take a little time at getting used to um, because these are not a spray it and forget it type of product. So they're most effective and safe when they're applied in the morning or the evening. And I'm gonna go over this a few times, really evenings what you wanna kind of uh, hone in on, but you, if you apply them in the morning or the evening, this minimizes the chances of affecting our beneficial insects. And that, you know, that includes honeybees. So precise timing also means that targeting the correct insect stage of development. So the immature stages are smaller and easier to kill than the adult stages. So this is where those reference resources are really gonna come in handy so you know what the immature stage looks like. The immature stage is also the one that's doing the feeding for the most part. So that's another reason why you really wanna target that, that immature stage. But besides timing, um, more frequent applications may also be necessary in order to do the, do the job because they have that fast breakdown. So once they dry, most of them are rendered ineffective um, and you may have to reapply as necessary according to the label. Another great trait is that they are fast acting. So some natural products like soaps and oils kill insects on contact. A lot of them are contact pest, uh, products. So other natural pesticides such as like microbial products uh, such as Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, genus, gensis, I always get that wrong, and spinosad um, have to either be ingested or ingested or, or contact and they cause that pest uh, to quickly stop feeding. But the thing is, although they may stop feeding, it may take hours or even days for that um, insect to die. But they are literally the walking dead. So we'll get into those in a little bit. So the last thing is that they have low toxicity. So that's low to moderate acute mammalian toxicity. So you just have to remember that nothing is 100% uh, toxicity free, right? Tox free, except for spraying nothing. But they also have low toxicity to beneficial insects um, if you apply them correctly, right? That's early morning, early in the morning or late in the afternoon when most of those beneficials are not actively foraging for food. So these products should be handled with the same level of care and uh, you know, caution needs to be used as you do for any sort of pesticide. Even if they're biorationals, they are still meant to kill or control. 
So you want to always follow the manufacturer's instructions when you use them and make sure you're, you're wearing the proper PPE that it calls for your, your personal protective equipment that it calls for that on the, on the label. Okay. There are some really great things about bio-rational pesticides. However, there are also some disadvantages of these, these products, although they are fairly easy to adjust for. The biggest thing is phytotoxicity. This is basically burning or frying your plant. So plants can be damaged by insecticidal soaps, by horticultural oils, by plant oils, sulfurs, especially when they're uh, applied at high rates or with those repeat applications. Now, phytotoxicity can be more pronounced for like stress plants that are in honey, um, you know, uh, hot, sunny locations. I kind of melded those two words together. But you want to make sure to, you know, read that label on, you know, so you can avoid injuring some of these plants. It's going to tell you on that label if there are specific plants that, it, that will, you know, this is going to cause injury to. But always be cautious when you're applying. Um, do you know? It's kind of like we we use our our spot treatment for things on our clothes. You also want to do a spot treatment first to make sure it's not going to negatively affect that plant. And then sometimes their cost and availability. Natural products, especially Omri. So um, Omri is the Organic Materials Review Institute. Those Omri approved versions are sometimes more expensive than conventional pesticides or sometimes even a little bit more difficult to find. But those OMRI approved uh, products are ones that are used for organic uh, gardening. Now, we are going to discuss two primary groups today, but you have to remember, biopesticides cannot be used on all insects at all times. So we're going to talk about which products work best against which specific uh, pests. We're going to discuss the groups of biochemical products. So these are the naturally occurring substances that control pests. And we'll also discuss the microbials. These are the living microorganisms that control pests. Now, microbials are quite specific. Um, this is very good for use in an IPM you know, management uh, program as it targets the specific pest. But you may already be using one which works really well against mosquito larvae as well as fungus gnat larvae, and that's Bt. Um, so another thing to keep in mind is that certain environmental conditions can decrease that activity or the effectiveness of these products. So as I said at the beginning, biopesticides are very good products for many reasons, but they're not always that magic bullet, and you still need to use caution um, when you're using them or applying them. Okay. First, we're going to discuss oils, and these are the plant and the petroleum-based products. So in general, oils are most effective against small, small soft-bodied insects and mites um, that, are, that are really kind of immobile or, or slow moving. So these are going to be our aphids, the scales, leafhopper nymphs, and whiteflies, you know, mainly. So you have to com have complete coverage by that oil spray for it to be effective. Now, oils are contact pesticides and they have no residual activity. They're, they're not going to prevent reinfestation of insects. So when it's dried, it's gone. So they need to be reapplied frequently in order to be effective. And when I say complete coverage, that means when you spray it, you want to spray it, make sure you're getting on the top and underneath that leaf and you're wanting to make sure you completely cover that insect. But how they work is when you spray it onto an insect, it can block that insect's breathing holes. Now the sphericals are located on the side of, the, uh, of their abdomen and this causes them to suffocate. So as you see here, just along the edges here are the, the sphericals. There's one opening per, uh, per segment, per body segment. Now the oils can also prevent gas exchange uh, through the egg membranes. So eggs can be controlled with oils, which is really good since eggs generally are really difficult to target due to that shell, right? It's, it's nature's gift is, is creating that egg shell. Um, not a lot of things penetrate and it really protects that, that, that embryo inside. Now, um, many also have repellent or anti-feeding properties, which um, can help reduce colony buildup with, those, with the more mobile uh, insects. 
Now, a few specific oils like mineral oils can interfere with virus transmission of insect vectors such as aphids and leafhoppers, and it reduces the chance of, of infecting of plant inf infections. So um, a side note is that piercing sucking pests are the insects we really need to be worried about. And since they are the ones that are the vectors for many uh, plant diseases, and they are typically the, our small soft bodied insects. Now, chewing insects, such as like grasshoppers and caterpillars and, and leaf beetles, they tend to just, they just cause aesthetic damage. And so the plant typically will recover from that. It's going to be ugly for a while, but it normally can recover. So chewing insects do not vector any diseases uh, between plants or two plants. It is our piercing sucking insects that do that. Now, horticulture oils. So these are called hoard oils or summon or dormant oils. They are highly refined lightweight oils um, that are more, most, uh, most often uh, derived from petroleum. So occasionally in the store, you're gonna see something called a dormant oil. Um, these are heavier oils. They're typically used during the dormant periods of growth. But you know, here in Florida, not typically used in, you know, especially in South Florida due to the warm temperatures, right? We, we, we're pretty much uh, warm year round. Now, hoard oils are mixed with water and they're sprayed um, onto the plants as you would for many, you know, like a typical liquid pesticide. So they can help manage many of those piercing sucking insects and, and mites. So these are the ones, right, that, that are vectoring diseases or potentially vectoring diseases. They're promoted as an insecticide, um, insect repellents, or sometimes it says both on the label. Now, you know, they work against those small soft-bodied insects such as aphids, whitefly, mealybug, and our scale insect uh, nymphs. Uh, so these are again, the, kind of our most common, our small soft-bodied insects, but they are less effective against hard-bodied adult insects, nor are they um, as effective against um, insects that have a real thick waxy covering but they do work against armored scale. It's one of our, one of our, we have soft and armored scale. So the hort oils work better against the, the armored scale. However, they do have extremely low toxicity and no residual effect after, after that spray has dried. So they, they are a really good bio-rational product. However, you do need to take precaution when you're using hort oils. And that's because these oils can be phytotoxic under high temperatures, meaning your plant can get sunburn. So this is especially with like your waxy succulents or sensitive plants uh, are a lot more susceptible. But the label is really going to tell you which plants are the, you know, are the most sensitive to, to these products. Now, hoard oils can have negative impact on natural enemies that are sprayed, right? So direct spray. And again, uh, natural enemies are the good insects that feed on the pest insects. So you want to try to avoid try to avoid applying these pesticides if those natural predators are actively feeding on the pests. Now, this may be challenging, but it's important to try and preserve the natural enemies if you can. Um, you know, I apologize, but I'm going to be saying this over and over again in this presentation, but it's best to apply these, these oils or these products either early morning or later in the afternoon, like closer to dusk. Later in the afternoon is best since the majority of those beneficial insects would have, they're already hunkered down for the evening. Um, they're lower down. They're not high in the canopy. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're deep in the canopy or in the case of bees, you know, honeybees, they're back at the hive. Whereas what happens with our pest insects, because they're piercing sucking insects, they stay attached to the plant and they're Im either immobile or very, very slow moving. But once they attach to the plant, for the most part, they are not moving. And they're gonna be find, found up at the tips of those plants. They may be underneath the leaves, but they're gonna be at the, you know, at the top of, of the, uh, the canopy in that new flush, because that fl new flush has a higher amount of nitrogen. And for the most part, insects are nitrogen limited, so that's where they're gonna be feeding, is where there's gonna be that, that, those high nutrient levels.
Now moving on to another biopesticide. So this is neem oil. Neem oil is extracted from the seed of the neem tree and it contains several insecticidal and fungicidal compounds, including the compound called azdiractin. So neem functions like an insecticidal soap and a hoard oil and insects do not build up resistance to neem. But again, you need to be careful with the timing so as not to affect those beneficial insects. Again, apply in early morning or late afternoon, preferably late afternoon. Um, but this also helps with minimizing phytotoxicity on that plant. Now, neem requires direct contact and complete coverage to kill the insect. And then some neem oils are actually labeled for prevention of, of several foliar plant diseases, which make it different from horticultural oils um, and a really good choice. It can control some of the fungus, you know, some of our funguses that grow on plants and, you know, including our vegetable plants. So this includes mildews, rust, uh, leaf spot, and stem rot. So it, it, neem is a really great product. Now for azdiractin. Now, again, this is extracted from the neem oil itself. So it controls several insect groups um, that can act as, you know, it acts as a feeding deterrent or an egg laying deterrent. Um, it's also a repellent, it's a direct toxin, or it's an insect growth regular. So azdiractin has a, a, a broader way of, of affecting um, insects. Now, azdiractin is not an oil. It's a component extracted from the neem oil. Now, it works well against immature stages of chewing pests. So it works really well against like, caterpillars, sawflies, weevils, uh, flea beetles, aphids, and leaf hoppers. So we have a little bit more uh, wider range of insects that you can use uh, azdiractin on. It does have some weak systemic activity when you apply it to the roots. So, you know, you know, systemic means it goes through the through the plant. So you would apply it as a drench. You know, you you mix it with water and pour it in onto the base of the plant, so it gets through the roots and goes up through the plant. But because it's a uh, you know it's a weak systemic, um, it may be enough to get you through an infestation where you need something um, a little stronger than just a spray. And this is going to, these may work well with like a, a small, a, a newly planted plant, right? Or a new sapling, a, a smaller, a smaller plant. Um, but you don't want to use that more aggressive conventional chemical or those more aggressive systemics. Um, there are other, other options to, to those. Now, moving on to our essential oils. Now, essential oils are usually, they're um, highly concentrated but they're often combined uh, with different plant oils, um, with plant extracts such as like pyrethrins or even fish oil. They're promoted as insecticides, insect repellents, or, or even both. Some are unique in that they often have like a bioactive compounds that offer uh, toxicity product uh, properties against pests beyond that smothering, right? We talk about these other things that you have to spray it and smother them and it, and it suffocates. Um, essential oils are, are a little bit different, but you have to have, you know, buyer beware in this case. Not all have proven success and oftentimes there is no efficacy data, data associated uh, with essential oils. Um, they are exempt from EPA registration so there's no guarantee that they are effective. However, uh, one great aspect of essential oils is that some of them can affect larger insects. So, you know, we talk about hoard oils are limited to being effective against small soft-bodied insects, but, um, you know, so these work a little bit better against these larger insects, but it's sort of a hit and a miss. Some essential oils can provide, you know, amazing control of certain pest insects, but they do nothing against other pest insects. So, you know, be sure to read the label. So although these products are more environmentally friendly, um, applying the product that is not going to work against that pest is still the use of, uh, is, is the wrong use of that product. So, you know, really, really read the label. But, you know, an, an example of this is like using a cockroach product against a flea, right? They're two completely different insects. They require two completely different types of treatment and products. So um, make sure you're reading the label and that that 
pest insect is on that label. But some of the most common oils that are used uh, in these essential oils are like sesame, garlic, uh, canola, and soybean oil. Some of those herbal extracts are uh, thyme, rosemary, uh, cinnamon, and clove are really uh, popular. And then other ones are like cedars, lavender, um, lavender is a big one, pennyroyal, uh, citronella. Citronella uh, and uh, eucalyptus are commonly used as like flea and mosquito repellents on, on both pets and humans, but their effectiveness uh, varies. But um, most co uh, common oils are regarded as low risk to humans and, and pets when you apply them as recommended. But again, read the label. And I would also recommend if you're using these in your home as like a, in vapors, right? You get those little, uh, you know, plug-in uh, misters. If it's an essential oil, I would make sure you check with your vet before you, you do that because um, cats especially can be very, very sensitive to some of these. And like pennyroyal is, is really detrimental to cats. So, um, you know, check with your vet or make sure you're, you're checking to, you're not um, injuring your, your pets in any way. Now, a really good um, product is, is citrus oil, but it's mainly used as a product to, you know, that we apply to, to, um, to animals. But citrus oils are, they're extracted from citrus peels and they act as a nerve poison. So common products that are, are quite effective are things like D-limaline and linalool, but many, uh, many of these are mainly for indoor uses but they're used against fleas and mites and, and aphids. There's one exterior, right, outdoor use. Um, they're, they're usually found as like aerosols, as shampoos, as liquids, or those, you know, those, remember those, those pet dips that we had? Um, so D-limaline can actually be used on tolerant uh, plants, but be careful. They may, it may cause phytotoxicity on sensitive plants. So again, you're gonna check that, that label to make sure you're applying it correctly and, and you're being safe. Now let's move on to insecticidal soaps. These are actually by far my, you know, one of my favorites. So insecticidal soaps contain potassium salts of fatty acids. They work against soft bodied pests. So our aphids, our soft scales, our psyllids, uh, whitefly, mealybug, uh, thrips, and spider mites. So the two, two spotted spider mite. Uh, soaps work in various ways. So it can remove that protective outer uh, wax coating uh, from the, the cuticle and it causes it to dehydrate. It also blocks the breathing holes, right? Those spiracles, and it can cause that insect to, to suffocate. But um, like a lot of these oils and other products, it must contact that insect directly in order to be effective. Now, the residues that remain on the plant after they dry have no insecticidal effect. But remember, this is actually a good thing because it, that means it's not gonna be able to affect uh, non-target organisms or non-target insects. So we, we don't want it to have any residual activity. Um, they work better on soft scale insects than, than the hort oils. Remember when I said the hort oils work better on armored scales, where these work better on soft scales. Now, the key to remember, uh, you know, how, you know, if you have a scale and you go, oh my gosh, which product do I use against scale, um, is the three S's. So soaps work, gets against, work best against soft scales and soft scales cause sooty mold. So if you see black buildup of mold on your plant, that means you have some sort of a piercing sucking insect. And what happens is that that sooty mold grows on the honeydew that those insects produce. So the difference between armored and soft scales is that soft scales produce honeydew, armored scales do not. So you're not going to see sooty mold associated with armored scale. So again, your three S's, insecticidal soaps, work against, best against soft scale because soft scale will have sooty mold associated with it. So when you're applying, uh, you know, like most of the rest, when you're applying these insecticidal soaps to your landscape plants, you want to spray it early in the morning or late in the afternoon, uh, as, as late as possible. Um, and this, again, is to minimize that contact with beneficial insects. 
If you get anything out of this presentation, it, you know, by the end, I hope you know that you either spray early morning or late afternoon. <laughs> so I get asked this question a lot. Can you make your own insecticidal soap solution? Well, the short answer is yes, you can, but I can't recommend it. And that is because, you know, we deliver information that is supported, you know, has, has scientific backing to support it. So when a product is something that you make in your kitchen, um, you know, then the ingredients, the amounts, and that safety and effectiveness are not consistent. So it can be, so, you know, so it can't be tested. You know, think about trying to make your, your grandma's recipes, right? I know I can never make exactly, make up, you know, the, the cakes and the pies exactly how my grandmother made it. That is because that recipe has a lot of interpretation to it. So we know that insecticidal soaps that are sold in the store are registered through the EPA and they have been tested for both the effectiveness and the safety. So we recommend purchasing a formulated product. So dish soap is actually a degreaser and most contain synthetic detergents, synthetic detergents, excuse me, not true soaps. So homemade, homemade formulations can either burn or injure your plants. And with that said, there are a ton of different recipes that you can find on the web for homemade recipes to make your own, your own soap. Um, there, you know, the link that's on this page is, um, it's a link to a UF IFAS fact sheet that gives in-depth information on why it's not recommended to make your own insecticidal soap. Um, so it's a, it's a really good informative um, um, fact sheet. Now, moving on to plant extracts. So um, these are the botanicals and they're the class that, we'll, that we're gonna talk about are the pyrethrins and the pyrethrums. Now, these are highly concentrated compound, compounds extracted from the chrysanthemum flower. Now, pyrethrum is the total extract from that flower and it's often applied in powder form where pyrethrins are a refined ester extracted from the flower that have toxic properties to insects. So uh, pyrethrins work against you know, a broad range of pests, such as ants and roaches, uh, fleas, flies, ticks, and garden pests. So they are often mixed with a synthetic pesticide or other natural product. And oftentimes they're mixed with a synergist. Um, uh, Piperonyl brutoxide uh, is, is one that's uh, really common. You'll see it as piperonyl brutoxide or, or PBO on the label. Now, that, that PBO is a synergist and an ins a synergist has no insecticidal property, but it increases the insecticidal activity of the active ingredient. Basically, it just gives that product a little boost, right? Instead of two plus two equals four, when you're using a, a synergist, two plus two equals five. Um, you know, simple way to think about it. Now, these products, um, they attack the nervous system of in insects so that the toxin and pyrethrin act rapidly on contact. And so it reaches that insect's nervous system and causes that out really quick knockdown or paralysis, um, right? That insect might flip on its back and start, you know, just kicking in the air and you, you think, woohoo, it's dead. However, sometimes that insect recovers because they can, they can um, um, metabolize or synthesize that, that product very quickly. Um, pyrethrins break down really quick in the environment, which is great. And they do have a short residual activity, um, which, you know, we thought about those, you know, talk about the other products it said they have no residual activity. Well, these have a, a, a little bit, very short. Um, but they do have low mammalian toxicity as well. But having that short residual activity isn't bad. Um, you know, it's, it's just a little bit different. Um, but pyrethrins are among the safest of the insecticides to use. But again, you're always going to read the label to make sure you're using it safely and correctly. Now, one caution about pyrethrins. Uh, pyrethrins are gradually replacing organophosphates, right? Our OPs and our organochlorides. Um, chlorines, excuse me, um, and those were our, you know, are the toxic broad spectrum pesticides that are also, you know, toxic to, to humans. But please do not confuse pyrethrins with pyrethroids. Pyrethroids are the synthetic analog of pyrethrins, and although they are good and effective products, 
what happens is they tend to accumulate in the environment and they do have residual properties. Um, and that, you know, and we're talking a long, you know, a long residual uh, property. And that is not ideal when we're thinking about safety and conservation of beneficial insects and effects on non-target organisms. So pyrethroids, uh, they pose a greater risk to predators and to parasitoid insects. So really, please be aware and know what you are purchasing when you're, when you're buying products um, at the store. Now, moving on to mineral insecticides. So we're going to first talk about diatomaceous earth, or DE. So DE is basically the, you know, it's fossilized uh, silica shell remains of diatoms. So it's really old, dead algae skeletons. So what it does is DE, it scratches that exoskeleton and absorbs the water protecting oils and the waxes um, from that outer body of that, of that insect. And that insect then loses essential water and it dehydrates and eventually dies. It's really uh, used for indoor pests. When we're talking about uh, Florida, you know, indoor pests mainly. Um, and so that's gonna be ants and fleas, bed bugs and cockroaches but it's rendered ineffective if it gets wet. And so it's really difficult to use outdoors, but it is a great product to use indoors. Now in Florida, whether it's, whether it's our, our hot uh, season, we have a lot of humidity, right? So things that are gonna affect it are gonna be irrigation, rain and humidity. So that's why it's never so great to, to use outdoors in Florida. Now DE has a very low mammalian toxicity you, you, you actually hear it used as a topical on pets, but you know, make sure you ask your vet first uh, because if you use it incorrectly, um, it can result in lung damage or eye damage and never use DE against the label. You can, what you can do when you're using it to try to control like either fleas or, or, um, or, or you know, lice is you can sprinkle it, especially fleas, I should say, sprinkle it on the pet's bedding or the areas where they, they, they lay, let it sit there for a while and then vacuum it up. So that way you, you know, it's, a it's getting on to those insects, but then you're a vacuum up, you know, could be the adult, the immature stage, or even the egg stages of those insects. However, only use, uh, you know, DE comes in a, a three different grades. So it comes in food grade, it food or natural grade, or insect grade, but then there's also swimming pool grade DE. Um, never ever use swimming pool grade DE as an insecticide because it's a lower grade. It's a lot it has a, it's a lot more uh, powdery. Even when you're using it in your as as a pool in your pool filter, you have to wear a dust mask. So never use uh, swimming pool grade DE as an insecticide. Only use food grade or insect grade. Okay, so, you know, we've discussed the soaps and the oils, the botanicals and the inorganics. Let's go ahead and move on to the microbials. Now, the microbials, first we'll talk about BT, so Bacillus serengensis, Genesis. I always get that wrong. So BT is a lot easier to say. So BT is naturally occurring bacterium. It's found in soil and fresh water, as well as on plant surfaces. It is the most common used microbial insecticide. So there are different subspecies available um, that target uh, specific pest groups. Um, and that's great because that means it's, it's great. It doesn't target non-target organisms, right? So it doesn't harm other organisms. So the proteins in the BT, they're toxic to that targeted insect when they're eaten, but they don't harm any other in, invertebrates. So once they're once eaten, those talk what those toxins do, they attack the insect cell, uh, the cells in their gut wall. Literally, they punch holes in that gut lining, and that insect's gonna die within a couple of days. They're typically used against either larval, the immature forms of insects. Uh, there are some, some, some subspecies that work against caterpillars or, or lepidopterans. And there's also a subspecies that is used on wax moth larvae um, that we've that has been a problem in honeybee hives. Uh, other subspecies, there's one for beetle larvae that UF has had been doing research on. Not sure where that stands at this point, but that was against the Sri Lankan weevil. I would love to see that come to market someday because uh, that would be a game changer, right? Because Sri Lankan weevil are, are a, um, they're a, a 
invasive species and there's really not a lot we can do for them. But Bt is incredibly effective. It's also reasonably priced uh, for biological and it's you know, the best part of it is that's very low risk to beneficial insects. Now, the drawbacks of Bt, you know, they break down rapidly in sunlight by those UV rays. So you may have to reapply it more often um, to control that pest insect. And they are very host specific, not a bad thing, but you have to make sure you use it against the life stage of the insect that you're trying to control that is on the label, right? These are, you know, they work against like lepidopterans, but they don't work against an adult moth. They work against its larval stage, its caterpillar stage. So it's really important to know uh, which stage that you're targeting. Now, BTI, so Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, this is uh, used against mosquito larvae, but it also has activity against black fly, black fly larvae as well as fungus gnats. Now, research has shown that there's little to no activity against dra dragonfly naiads or the dragonfly larvae. This is a great thing since those are beneficial insects and they actually eat uh, mosquito larvae. Now, um, there are, they come in two different forms. So they come in either mosquito dunks or mosquito uh, bits. Mosquito dunks, uh, you wanna use in larger bodies of water, such as like rain barrels or small ponds stormwater drains, uh, bird baths, tree holes, rain gutters, especially rain gutters, uh, that type of thing. Somewhere where uh, there's standing water that's gonna be sitting, you know, be, that's gonna be there that almost needs to be there. Rain gutters are one that you, know, you, if you don't, you, you really should clean out your rain gutters, but it's great to put one of these dunks in there so that if you end up getting a clogged rain gutter, um, you know that you're, you're fighting against mosquito larvae buildup in that area because of that BT. But uh, mosquito bits, these can be used in smaller bodies of water, um, stationary water that cannot be drained, but things like bromeliads or other you know, water holding plants, they're easier because you can sprinkle them on. Now, mosquito bits are great for potted plants, um, either on your lanai or indoors. What you can do is you can sprinkle the bits on the soil surface and it's gonna help control fungus gnat, uh, fungus gnat larvae. Um, because those are big nuisance. I'm one, I have a heavy hand when I'm watering my in, indoor plants. And so that those larvae live on the upper you know, inch of, that, of the soil surface. So the best thing to do is let it dry out and, and you're gonna get rid of those fungus gnats. But if, again, like me, if you water a lot, if you sprinkle these mosquito bits on top as you water, that uh, bacteria is gonna come off and the, then those larvae are gonna uh, be able to feed on that that BTI and it will take care of them. Now, mosquito management uses a great deal of BTI when they're spraying for mosquitoes. Um, and just always know it's always a lot easier to control the larval stage than it is the adult stage. So kind of mentioned that earlier as well. Now, moving on, so spinosad. This is an, you know, is an amazing product that has kind of a wider insect profile than other microbials. Spinosad is also from a soil bacteria, um, like, like BT, BT is. Um, it attacks the nervous system of insects, but unlike BTI, it works as both a contact and in an in ingestion. So that, you know, that insect doesn't need to just eat it in order for it to be effective. It's better than other microbials in that it has a little bit, <laughs> I know this, is, I'm kind of, uh, countering what I said earlier, but it has a little bit broader spectrum of activity against other insects and especially good at controlling thrips. Now, if we think about broader spectrum, it's still insect specific, but that it's specific to a few more insects, but they're all pest insects. Now, spinosad stops insects from feeding within a few minutes of contact. And then it may take a few days actually for that insect to stop feeding. However, um, that's what you want. You want it to stop feeding. So if it stopped feeding, as we talk about it being kind of a zombie insect, you know, it's kind of the walking the dead because what happens is that that is still gonna be a, a food source. That, that insect has stopped feeding on the plant, but it is still a food source for predators. So this is, you know, 
this is going to keep your birds happy, your other predatory insects. Um, maybe you know if you have other wildlife that's that's feeding on those insects. Now, spinosad is very uh, good from a toxicity aspect against non-target organisms, has a real low to moderate effect on beneficial uh, organisms, and very low um, activity to mammals, you know, if any, uh, to mammals or wildlife. But as far as negative aspects of spinosad, right, you know, want to make sure we, we, we point this out. It is highly toxic to bees, but it's only toxic to bees um, when it's wet. So once it's dried, the residual has, has very, very little effect on bees, if any. So again, if you spray it, a bee with, with spinosad, it's going to die. So again, we're going to want to spray it early morning or later in the afternoon. Later in the afternoon is preferred because you know most of your bees are going to be back at the hive at that point. So again, um, very good product. Be, be cautious around, um, around bees. Now, I'm just going to go over these quickly. Intimate path pathogenic uh, fungi, they're a type of, of fungus. They thrive in, you know, they're typical. They thrive in moist environments. Um, you know, the spores germinate and then they penetrate that insect. Thing about these is they don't need to be ingested by the pest. They just need to come in contact with it. Now, the intimate pathogenic nematodes, um, yes, there are good nematodes. Uh, they're parasitic nematodes, and these nematodes work against soil-dwelling pests, uh, and same thing, they just have to come in contact with it, they enter any natural opening in that insect, and then they, what they do is they release a bacteria into the insect that then feeds in, in, inside the insect, it reproduces, and then it bursts out from that, that insect. Another good thing um, besides controlling insects with these nematodes is that they do not feed on plants. So again, there are some, some beneficial uh, nematodes. Now, a few products that are used quite extensively, um, especially in organic gardening, are things like vinegar and corn gluten meal. Now, vinegar applications affect only the tissue. They don't affect the root system. So it has a foliar burn down property only and has no systemic uh, property. Now we know, I'm not gonna mention it, but we know another product that is, is widely used. Um, you spray it on, it, it, it goes translaminar through the plant or systemic, goes down to the root and kills off that entire weed. However, vinegar only does a burn down. Um, if you're using vinegar, uh, if, you're, if you're using a, uh, an herbicide grade vinegar, make sure you're following the label like you do with any pesticide. Even though it, it's acetic acid or vinegar, it's still a, you're still using it as, as an herbicide. So be sure to wear the proper P, PPE. But you need to be aware. So for acetic acid, anything with concentration over 11%, can burn the skin, it can cause eye damage. Um, and 11% is what you typically find in an herbicide product uh, vinegar, right? That, that one you, you can go and find in the, in the garden center. Now concentrations above 20%, this is commercial grade. You know, above 20% or 20% 20, 20 and above, I should say, is corrosive to many metals as well as, as to concrete, right? It can eat through concrete. Um, it can cause blindness. So, you know, I don't like to use, I don't even like to let, use the, the herbicide grade um, vinegar. So especially don't like to use, I will not use uh, commercial grade uh, vinegar. But household vinegar is 5%. And if you use it as a, you know, straight without adding water, um, it will be uh, sufficient to burn down that weed tissue, but you're going to have to do a reapplication. But what happens with that is if you keep burning down that tissue, right? We know that's how the plant actually feeds itself. So if you keep burning down that, that tissue, it's gonna eventually kill off that, that, um, that entire weed, right? Or it's gonna at least um, make it to the point where you can just easily pull that out by hand. But again, always, 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 read and follow the label directions because, you know, I haven't said this yet, but the label is the law. So you really do have to follow that label. Now with corn gluten meal, does it work? Well, 
this is truly one of those things that's a hit and a miss. It's, uh, you know, kind of sort of like that with a few of the, the natural products, but corn gluten meal acts as a pre-emergent against germination by an, it inhibits the group, the root formation. It does absolutely nothing against an existing weed or even a, you know, a seed that's already germinated. So you're going to want to put it on as a pre-emergent. Um, you're not going to want to break that barrier. And um, so it may or may not work. It's definitely worth a try. Um, if anything, it's going to add, you know, it's, it's going to eventually break down as compost and, and create compost. So um, again, it's only used as a, a really kind of a preventative only. Okay. So that was the last of our bi-rational products for this presentation. There are a few I didn't talk about, but have some, you know, they have some limits that don't make them as useful as other. But things like insect growth regulators are amazing products, but I didn't have enough time to talk about them. I'll just say that they, they're they amazing, they're effective, they're a good option, um, but they are, IGRs are typically a, a conventional product, but they're the newer products. They're great to use. Anyways, so to sum up this, um, I wanted to circle back to the use of pesticides. So any pesticide should only be considered as a last resort and not, not the go-to to resolve the issue. If you do use a pesticide, always be sure you know the insect you are targeting and you do a proper insect identification and you're targeting the right uh, insect life stage. Only do spot treatments. You want to, you know, target that affected affected area only, and always use you know uh, any product with the lowest impact, and always read the label. Try at all costs to avoid conventional chemicals because these a lot of them are known to be carcinogenic, neurotoxin, endocrine disruptors. So you know the health of you is really important. So you know those those really are are very specific uses for those in specific you know, situations. So um, you can tell uh, the toxicity of a product by the signal word that's printed on the label. So if you're ever gonna use one, use one that has either no caution word or a, a no signal word or caution as a signal word. Stay away from warning and especially stay away from ones that have danger or danger poisons, you know, skull and crossbones. Bleach actually is a danger uh, signal word. So very important to always read the, the label. And as always, make sure you're wearing the appropriate PPE. Um, even if you think that product is fairly harmless, say you're using vinegar, right? If you're using herbicide grade PPE, you really, uh, um, uh, herbicide grade vinegar, you really wanna read that label, and make sure you're using the proper PPE. Remember, uh, these products may be alternative pesticides or bio-rational pesticides because they're considered minimal risk pesticides, but they are still pesticides. And pesticides are used, you know, or they're meant to kill. So you want to stay safe. You only have one you. Um, a weed is not the end, end of the world. You need to stay safe. And I always end my presentations with, with this, uh, this saying uh, by Carl Hofker, Hofker. When we kill off our natural enemies of a pest, we inherit their work. So for that, I use these resources for this presentation. And I want to say thank you. And here is my contact information. And um, oh, here is my contact information. And I'm happy to assist you in any way possible. You have a great day. And thank you for joining.